Turn on the video. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hare Krishna. Welcome everyone to our second session on the nectar of instruction at the level of Bhakti Shastri. Uh, we left last evening with uh, some little homework for you. I asked the men to come up with some strategies in how to control different urges and the women, they were going to come up with strategies for controlling the urge to speak and the anger. We wanted to hear from the man about how to control bodily urges and urges of the mind. So do we have some, can we have some response from the devotees there? Someone like to offer? Do we, do we have the the hands up anywhere? Yes, uh, some devotees have raised hand. If uh, Maharaj can see us, yeah, see the on the participants. Yes, you can see Adi Raj Das, Advait Chandra Das, and if you click on chat, it will it will take out this window. Yes, now you see three people have raised. Three people have raised Adi Raj Das, Advait Chandra, and Oh, they've got answers, isn't it? Yes, they have raised hands too. Oh, really? Okay. So, Adi Raj Prabhu, you'd like to respond? Adi Raj? I'm not able to hear anybody. Is he speaking? Is he? But, uh, oh, is the. Where? We cannot hear you, Adi Raj Prabhu, and I'm trying to see if the speaker connected. It seems the audio is not coming. Let's see. Check, check the speaker. So, yeah. In the meantime, I will uh, connect my audio. Hare Krishna, can we hear you again, Prabhu? Hare Krishna, can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear, yeah. Okay, I'm on the urges of the body. Um, so, like, we can control uh, what we eat. Uh, taking Krishna Prashad. Um, because if we control what we eat and uh, regulate the times of our eating, it will help us to control our tongue and then belly and then our genitals. That's what I think. Well, we also, you know, it's also mentioned there in Prabhupada's purport about the danger of taking opulent Krishna prasadam. So just taking Krishna Prasadam, that's not enough, right? Yes, correct, yes. Because you may take all the maha, you may like to go for all the, the maha, the very, the very sweet or the very special maha prasadam. Yes, I usually like a lot of maha. <laughs> so, so that's not, you know, if, in, if, if you have to be a little careful about this. If you say you're just going to take Krishna Prasadam, you could be a, a real sense gratifier, just eating a lot of nice Maha Prasadam. Okay. So you're going to control the tongue, you have to watch, on, watch out for that. What about, what about controlling the mind? We'll hear from another man. Advaita Chandra Prabhu.
Advaita Chandra Prabhu, are you there? We want to hear about controlling the mind, your strategy to control the mind. We cannot hear you, Advaita Chandra Prabhu. Can you speak? Can you speak up? Is your mic connected? Okay, we have to ask somebody else. We're not hearing you at all. Tukaram Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj Dhanupana. Dhanupana. Maharaj, we can control Arjuna's mind by planning and thinking how we can preach Krishna consciousness in different places. We can make different strategies for preaching, so this is how our mind will get engaged. Okay. You just going to think 24 hours about how to spread Krishna consciousness? You're not going to think about anything else? You're only going to think about spreading Krishna consciousness? Uh, Maharaj, the mind wants variety, so sometimes we can engage it in thinking about preaching. Sometimes when we are cooking, we can engage our mind. When we are uh, hearing Krishna Katha, before we can engage our mind. While chanting, we can try to focus. While reading, we can try to engage. So variety is the mother of environment. If mind will get relishment, then naturally it will not go for uh, sense gratification. Okay. Yeah, we need some variety, definitely. You have to, you can't just simply only think one way. You have to have some variety, some different engagements for the mind to keep the mind absorbed and remembering Krishna. So thinking about distributing Krishna consciousness is one thing, but you, you, there, there would have to be a lot more than just simply thinking about that. Because you're not going to be all the time thinking about spreading Krishna consciousness. That's not such an easy thing to do. There has to be a lot of, a lot, a lot of other ways to engage the mind. Maybe, you know, maybe you can mention some but memorizing slokas is very good, a good engagement for the mind. Memorizing verses, slokas, some devotees, they don't like it, but it's a very good engagement to keep the mind absorbed. And then, uh, if you have to preach, if you're able to give classes, if they ask you to give lectures and so on, that takes a lot of work, a lot of preparation. You have to plan, you have to think what to say, how you're going to present the subject, what's the sloka, what's the topic of the class. It's also a very good engagement, preaching. And of course also, if, you, if you're a kirtanir, learning to play instruments is also very good. And thinking new different new tunes, different melodies, to chant the Maha Mantra, different ways. So we always have so many things to do, so much to learn, so many scriptures to read. We just have to keep our mind absorbed in these things. Okay, we'll hear from the ladies. The ladies were asked to tell us about strategies in controlling anger and controlling speech. Gita Indulekha Maharaj is there. Radha Kishori Maharaj. Yes, speak up, can't hear you. Speak up. Actions for anger. We should always meditate, think about the results of anger. Like the, there are two types of, uh, uh, like one is uh, we, if we get anger on others, then it's violence. And if on ourselves, then it is, it, we, it is depression. So there are many, uh, like uh, there may be headache or sleep, if, if 
there is no sleep, sleep is not proper or high bp anxiety and uh, even our family relationships are spoiled and our body mind actions and senses are all spoiled because of anger and the spiritual development is not there and consciousness also it's contaminated so so we should always uh, remember the results of uh, anger and also we should uh, look at the root causes of anger like this false ego uh, it's because of false ego and uh, when our desires are not fulfilled then uh, we get frustrated so we should work on it that we, uh, we should control our mind and senses and not have too many desires and uh, other reasons is that we make assumptions about others so we should stop making assumptions about others and uh, it's better to do introspection and uh, it will help so, and uh, we should always see only our area of concern uh, we, should, we should have to work on ourselves, not to, uh, not on our anger, not anger of X, Y, Z other persons. And uh, uh, our expect, we have over expectations of from others. We should also leave that. That is also not of area of concern, because the mind and senses are not in control and they are not in peace. Uh, that's why this is happening. And we should come contemplate on our sense objects also as in Bhagavad Gita is said Dhyayata Vishyam Kunsa that shlok uh, 2.62 we should contemplate our senses and we should also understand what we give we get in response also and uh, we should always change our version uh, the vision of seeing also we should always remember 15.7 and should see God everybody's God's part and parcels and same two shlokas are in Ishok Nisha also, like, like that uh, uh, Yastu Sarvani, Karmani and Yasmi, there are two shlokas and Ishok Nisha is about this also. And we should never wait for the people to change their behavior, we should change ourselves. And we should think like anger is our enemy, oh I have to throw it back. Uh, like uh, we should always remember 3.37 shloka, Kamesha Kodesha, it's, a, it's, it's leading me to hell, we should think like this, Trividam Narka Sedam. Dwaram Nashna Matmana, Kram Kodas Tata Lobas Tasmat Itap Trayam Treji. Which always think that it's leading me to hell. It's my sinful enemy. I have to not be in anger. And uh, we should, uh, sometimes anger just is because of not good communication. We should always have a very straightforward communication with, with each everybody because uh, it, it's help us. And we should learn to forget and forgive also. It's help. But in every everything all the material things have their solution in the spiritual so the most important is if we have good sadhana we should chant good properly uh, reading and listening lectures it's, it's the real krishna conscious the real solution of all problems in like anger and we should always remember uh, like uh, great characters like uh, Prahlad Maharaj, Yudhishthira Maharaj, Parikshit Maharaj, uh, they, they, never sh they don't show anger in such or difficult uh, situations also. And uh, we should engage in ourselves in many spiritual activities so that our minds get occupied and see, try to see good qualities in others. And we should develop like compassion heart and we need to help everybody and not, not to destroy it. And three things are there like love, respect, and service attitude. This should be there. And we should, always, we should always wait and think. Think before we act. And okay, I think. We also think. One point more. Yeah. One point more. Okay. Uh, if we uh, th we should also think in this way. And if we forgive others, then one day maybe they. they other person will also forgive you otherwise that person in the future maybe he also want to take revenge type so we should forgive others and in this way they will also forgive us if we commit mistakes oh thank you very much a very thorough answer you really gave a lot of examples a lot of points very interesting one one important point you know is that we often speak about using anger in the service of krishna but that can be a little dangerous unless we are the master of the senses. Without being the master of the senses, it's very difficult to utilize anger in the service of Krishna. You know, we cannot just imitate Arjuna and Hanuman. They could use anger in the service of Krishna, 
but we're not like them. So you have to be very careful about that, about trying to utilize that anger in Krishna's service. So thank you very much. Uh, so maybe we'll just hear one more Maharaji speak about controlling the urge to speak. Hmm? Maharani Mataji. She there? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. Um, uh, I'm afraid I'm not very advanced in uh, controlling the silences. So my controlling the urge to speak over the years was a big problem for me. I'm from Ireland and we have a very great habit of speaking too much. So um, I started to pray intensely over the years to the Lord. And um, gradually, gradually, I got the help that I needed. And uh, I try only to speak about Krishna and, as you said, memorizing verses and uh, chanting. Okay. So um, that's, that's my prayer. I depend on the grace of, of, of Krishna and prayer to not leave me, to protect me from situations where um, I may speak too much or the wrong things. Or become involved in unnecessary conversations that are not uh, that are just very destructive, which I have done in the past. So through terrible uh, bad experiences, um, Krishna showed me you must pray and depend constantly on the mercy of the Lord for help. So that's my experience. Okay, 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 very good. Thank you very much. That's very nice. You had you had personal experience. You have some realization on this, and you're really endeavoring, and you you feel you're getting somewhere. You're beginning to control that urge. Very nice. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go ahead. We're. We, I want to go back into that PowerPoint. We have that yes. first yes. PowerPoint. We can open the PowerPoint. No, I have to. And then uh, yes, you can. Uh, first, click on this. Click yeah. on that share screen. Share screen. And yeah. then uh, desktop one. Desktop. Yeah. So now the entire desktop. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Don't need that. Don't need that. Let me see. I've got the. It's in the uh, NOI. Yeah, here. Number one. What's this one? One. Yeah, we're on one. We didn't finish one. I just wanted to finish some things there. Oh, let me see. Yes, yeah, that was a group exercise. Okay, okay, just the objectives. Clear from current slide. Oh, yeah, from current slide, yeah. Yes, now just uh, clear from. Okay, so here you can see the objectives, what we covered yesterday. We gave the overview of the Upadesha Amrita. Not a big book, we just have a, a 11 slokas and then the purpose of the Sri Upadesha Amrita, the purpose, make us all Goswamis, <laughs> right? Everyone's going to become a Goswami. The study of Upadesha Amrita can help to improve our attitude in Krishna consciousness. The attitude, Prabhupada talked in impressed on us the importance of the correct attitude. The attitude being that we, we simply want to surrender to Krishna and serve Krishna. We want to take full shelter of Lord Krishna. And the appropriate means, then we went on to text one and we looked at the different urges and we've been talking about appropriate means of controlling these urges. So this is a personal application, important for all of us. We have to control these urges. Prabhupada's mood and mission, we had spoken about Srila Rupa Goswami. Prabhupada had uh, introduced Rupa Goswami to the English language by translating uh, Upadesha Amrita. And then, of course, previously it already translated and published the Nectar of Devotion. So in this way he was bringing the literature of 
the, or the writing of Rupa Goswami into the Western world, the English-speaking world, and introducing the mission of Lord Chaitanya. We described how just as uh, Lord Brahma was empowered with the Vedic knowledge by Lord Krishna, Srila Rupa Goswami was empowered by Sri Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to write books on Krishna consciousness. And we talked about how Krishna consciousness movement is conducted under Srila Rupa Goswami. The Srila Ru Rupa Goswami is the head, the leader of the six Goswamis, the senior most. In his spiritual body, he's Rupa Manjari. As Rupa Manjari, he leads the Manjaris in making arrangements for the pastimes of Radha and Krishna. And similarly, in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mov movement, Srila Rupa Goswami gives us the proper standards of renunciation, the proper Vaishnava conduct, activities of devotee. So we are, we are following Srila Rupa Goswami. And Srila Rupa Goswami follows Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's the direct disciple of Lord Chaitanya, and he's instructing us just as Lord Chaitanya instructed him. Okay. So, final quote from Srila Prabhupada. In all spiritual affairs, one's first duty is to control his mind and his senses. Unless one controls his mind and senses, one cannot make any advancement in spiritual life. Everyone in this material life is engrossed in the modes of passion and ignorance. One must promote himself to the platform of goodness, sattva -gun by following the instructions of Rupa Goswami, and then everything concerning how to make future progress will be revealed. So this point comes up again and again in the Bhakti Shastri course, the importance of coming to the platform of Sattva Gun, the mode of goodness, getting free of the passion and ignorance. So this is Rupa Goswami's instruction, and Srila Prabhupada has also impressed us on all of us. This is Srila Rupa Goswami's samadhi, as it used to be in Radha Damodar temple, Vrindavan. Now the, the whole place is enclosed with a big building, quite different. <laughs> anyway, his divine body is still entombed there. All right, so we're, we're going to finish there with the, the first sloka, and we're going to go on to text number two. Let me close this. All right. Oh, my goodness. What? All right. So can I close this yes, now? Yes. Am I still on screen sharing? Yes, your screen is screen sharing. Okay, listen to. Oh. If you want, we can stop the share for some time. Then. You can stop the share from here. Oh, stop the share. Okay. So now the screen is no longer sharing. Okay. So we're going to go on to lesson number two. Uh, Text number two, rather. I think maybe I'll, I'll put it in yes. back into the screen. You know, we have the, the sloka there. Uh, slideshow. Play from start. Okay. 
So we explain these things. The first, remember the first four verses are all your memorization verses. Here's a nice quote. This is from the commentary on the Upadesha Amrita. People in the waiting room. Okay. Somebody's coming around my screen. So this is a quote by Radha Raman Goswami who was a Gaudiya Vaishnavacharya in the Radha Raman temple and he wrote a commentary on Upadesha Amrita. I'm given a little quote here just for the benefit of the devotees. He mentions about the relationship between this first verse and the second verse. He said, in the beginning stage of the practice of bhakti, the material proclivity is prominent in the hearts of the sadhakas. Therefore, they are unable to subdue the six overwhelming passions described in the first verse. Consequently, in this condition, many tendencies that are very harmful to bhakti develop in the hearts of the sadhakas. In this verse, those injurious tendencies are being described for the benefit of the sadhaka, right? So we're going to hear what are these tendencies which come when we don't control these overwhelming passions which were mentioned in the first verse. Remember, the urge to speak, the mind's demands, the actions of anger, as well as the urge of the tongue, belly and genital. So when they're not controlled, the result is the tendencies are manifest in what are described in text number two. There's a question. Oh, I explained sadhikas in the last class yesterday. I explained the word sadhaka. I said sadhaka means a practitioner, someone who's practicing bhakti yoga. So someone who's doing regular sadhana means waking up early, chanting Hare Krishna, reading scriptures, offering their food to Krishna. This is all part of sadhana, the regulative program of bhakti yoga. So when someone does the practices these activities, is known as a sadhaka. Alright, so we'll chant this verse. You can all chant with me. Atyahara prayashascha Prajapo niyamagraha Jana Sangas Chalo Yamcha Shadbir Bhakti Vinashyati All right, translation is there. Devotional, a, devotional service is spoiled when he becomes too entangled in the following six activities. First one, at yahara, eating more than necessary or collecting more funds than required. Okay, two tendencies are there. This tendency towards at yahara, very prominent in this modern times, that we collect much more than we actually need. And it's going on all over the world. You can see we have more clothes than we ever had. People have so many pairs of shoes. People have mobile phones, computers, cars, houses. 
so many houses, there's so many properties. Of course, not everyone is guilty of this, but uh, there are a, a percentage of the population who are very much guilty. And it can also affect devotees. Devotees can also become absorbed in Atyahara. Then Prayashash, Prayasha, Prayashas, over endeavouring for mundane things, very difficult to obtain. So it follows from Atyahara that, you know, we want to collect more, we have more desires, and we want more and more, and then Prayashas comes. We will endeavour like anything to fulfil our goals, to get our dreams, working day and night. Sometimes people not satisfied with one job. They have a job in the day, a job at night, and another job on the weekend. Just working 24 hours a day. Why? Because Atyahara. Then Prajalpa, talking again, idle talk, means talk which is not in relation to Krishna. Niyama Agraha, an interesting topic which we will look at in more detail, just to mention it briefly as it's described here. Niyam, of course, means the rule, rules and regulations. And then agraha and agraha, different meanings. One is rejecting the rules and regulations and acting independently or whimsically, which is obviously a problem. But it's also a problem if one practices the rules and regulations only for the sake of following them and not for spiritual advancement. One may follow them simply for material benefit, material goals. So the purpose must be to make spiritual advancement. Then Jana Sangha, association with worldly-minded people, in other words, people who are not devotees. Then loyam, ardent longing or greed. So, shabir bhakti vinashati, destroyed. Our devotional service is destroyed by these things. Greed. We should be greedy for Krishna consciousness, but if we are simply greedy for mundane things, then this is a problem. This is not good, not what you want. We have to know what we want to get, what is the goal. Srila Prabhupada explains in his purport, human life is meant for plain living and high thinking. Problem is, not everyone wants that. <laughs> We want to have, plain living is really not what we want. Most people, they want to have very sophisticated living, very high standards of living and thinking. They don't think. People in, odd, odd people in Kali Yuga in the modern times, they try not to think. But we're meant to use the mind, we are meant to think and meant to cultivate thoughts of Krishna and the spiritual goal of life. So Srila Prabhupada explains here how the living entities are the marginal potency and either we are under the spiritual energy or the material energy. When we are under the spiritual energy, we are controlled. And when we're under the material energy, we're also controlled. We're never free, but we, we, we have to decide where we want to be controlled. Do you want to be under Krishna's control or under Maya's control? But either way, we're not going to be free. People have the illusion that they're free, but actually they're always controlled. And because they're controlled by the material energy, 
the, ma the material energy puts him through different miseries, which we will speak about. So, how to avoid this? Prabhupada explains in the purport of text number two, in the material world, one has to work for the maintenance of the body and soul. But how one can perform such work in a way that is favourable for the execution of Krishna consciousness? So this has to be understood, that we have to work. Krishna didn't tell Arjuna, sit back and I'll do everything. He told Arjuna, you have to work, you have to do your duty. Now, so similarly, we also have to work, we have to maintain the body and, and the soul. But we have to learn how to work in a manner, such a way that it is favourable for our Krishna consciousness. So with the help of Rupa Goswami, we're going to learn what to avoid, what, how to actually work in a manner which is favourable for our Krishna consciousness. Right? Here's text number three. Six favourable activities which will help us to develop our Krishna consciousness, right? I'll just put the verse on, we can chant. Okay. Utsahan nischaya daryat. Tat tat karma pravartanat. Sangatya gat sato vrite. Shadbir bhakti prasidyati. So six principles favorable for pure devotional service. First of all, utsahan, enthusiasm. Very important. Number two, nischayat, endeavouring with confidence. And number three, dhariyat, being patient. So these three things, utsahan, nischayat, dhariyat. Srila Prabhupada explains, enthusiasm, confidence and patience are necessary in every endeavour, whatever we're doing. These three things are required, and particularly here in a, the application of devotional service. We have to be enthusiastic, we should endeavour with confidence, and we should be patient. And then the other three, tat tat karma pravartanat, meaning acting according to the regulative principles, like hearing and chanting and remembering. Sangat chiagat, again, giving up the association of non-devotees. And finally, satovrite, following in the footsteps of the previous acharyas. These six principles assure complete success of pure devotional service. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains in his commentary, the first half of this verse, specifically, utsahan nischayat dairyat, enthusiasm, confidence and patience, that this indicates attitudes that are favourable for the cultivation of bhakti. And the second half describes how a devotee should conduct his life. So the second half, tatat karma pravartana sangat chyagat satovrite, meaning practising regulated principles like hearing and chanting, giving up the association of non-devotees and following the footsteps of the Acharyas. This is how we should conduct our life. So, 
This is Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur's uh, advice to all of us. Uh, I want to spend a little time, let's see, where is this? Can I get out of this? <laughs> where is this? I want to go forward or just I want to go, want to go out into another slide so I have a yeah. oh. oh okay that's good yeah mm. we'll, we'll go to this one do I have to open slideshow again yeah yes oh there yeah Yeah, I want to show you this, highlighting the problems which are facing today by way of our own Ajahara. The nature of the world, particularly the present times more than ever, there's a lot of poverty, a lot of joblessness, a lot of malnutrition, so many different problems around the world, around the globe. pointed out 20% of the world population consume over 80% of the earth's natural resources. So 20% people are enjoying, the other 80% they don't enjoy so much, they're having the problems. Why? The problem is, we're all thinking, I need more, I don't have enough, right? The greed, I need more, I have to have more. And of course, we're always encouraged, keep working, work harder. Happiness is just around the corner, just now coming. Earn more money, work harder, get more, buy more things, keep going. Happiness is just around the corner. So this is the idea, the consumer industry, we're encouraged, work, earn, spend, keep going. Does it mean you're going to be happy? No, the, the happiness, well, where is it? We're looking for it, we're trying to find it in the material world, but it's very difficult to find happiness. We're trying to get happiness from these material things, this consumerism. We're thinking, if I have this, I will be happy. And so under the illusion that I will enjoy, we purchase so many of these different objects which are there on the market today, just for our sense gratification. So many brand names, so many big names, different products and they're all promising, if you buy my product you will enjoy. Just to show you how much we have ruined the planet, here's an interesting uh, situation, something which happened there, South China, between Guangzhou and Shenzhen, a mall, 6.5 million square feet. The, one of the biggest ever projects, ever biggest malls practically ever built. And a lot of people in the area. And so it opened in the year 2005 and there's like 9 million people living around within 12 miles of the mall. But only about 1% of the mall is occupied, not even 1%, <laughs> a, a total failure. They built this huge shopping plaza, which was going to be a paradise for all the shoppers to come and purchase, and it's just sitting empty. Hmm. This is uh, what goes on in the Kali Yuga. We, we waste so much of the land, the resources, building these things. 
Oh. <laughs> An interesting little cartoon. Depression. I'm depressed, so what should we do when we're depressed? I'll go shopping. And we're told, yeah, very good. The economy is counting on your continued unhappiness because then you, you keep going shopping. You keep spending more money. That's good for the economy. So they're happy if we're all depressed. Because when we're depressed, we'll go and purchase, we'll go and buy more things, we, we think we feel happier. This is the illusion. And you can see the effects of all this consumerism on the world. Look at the air, the water, the land, the pollution, how much we have ruined the world. Of course, this uh, pandemic has helped quite a bit. The Yamuna River has cleaned up a lot. We've seen in India here, because of the pandemic situation, the Yamuna River looks much better than it's looked in the last 40 years. But still there's a long way to go. The effects of consumerism, very harmful. Con how they affect the environment, the planet. Some of the most polluted cities in the world. First of all, Ludhiana, India, the most polluted city. Just today, I think, in the papers, or I saw somewhere on the internet about India, Delhi, the air, how the, the pollution is so bad. So this has been going on for years. Ludhiana, which is Punjab, right? One of the most polluted cities. And then Lan, Lanzhou, China, Lanzhou over in Gansu, China, they have a lot of big uh, chemical plants there, it's also very polluted. Then Mexico, all these, Indonesia's then, Madan, Indonesia's also there, number four in the list. So you can see this is the world today situation, how much pollution there is all around the world. Pollution index, Beijing 700 plus, Montreal 11.2, Toronto 7.9. Well Montreal and Toronto are certainly a lot better off than Beijing. Just think about all those people in Beijing, more than 10 million people in Beijing. Montreal, Toronto, hardly have that. They're small, small places compared to Beijing. So they don't have the same, but they have also pollution, even though. So pollution is everywhere around the world. And then the effects of consumerism, waste. The waste which we produce. The waste, food waste paper waste, plastic waste. You know, we see people all the time taking the garbage and we're encouraged nowadays to sort the garbage, to sort out the perishable and the non-perishable and the plastic and the glass and the metal and the steel. So this is all the waste. Mentioned here, 250 million tons before recycling. That was in 2011, nine years ago. But 250 million tons around the world. E-waste, what about e-waste? And that's, this, this is an old figure, this is 2010 also. I did this PowerPoint years ago. I remember I, I should update my figures. But anyway, just to show you what it was like 10 years ago, it's much worse now. Of course, with the pandemic, it's gone down. But just imagine, thousands of tons of computers, televisions, and refrigerators. China, India, Kenya, and China. 1,300 
thousand tons of televisions, refrigerators, 700,000 tons of refrigerators. India, 300,000 tons televisions, 100,000 tons refrigerators. These are big problems in the environment, that kind of waste. And then it's true not only with the electri electronic, electrical devices, but also with our food that were very wasteful. Food is wasted. Farming, handling, processing, distribution and consuming. At every stage there's a lot of waste. Each dustbin in this diagram represents 20 kgs of food wasted per year per capita. Per year, per capita, means per capita, means per, per 20 kg of food per year, per person. Look at all the dustbins. So, all over the world this is going on, this problem. The world has enough for our need, not enough for everyone's greed. Solution, isyavasyam. Just like the Mataji was talking about anger, here again, quoting Ishopanishad, Ishavashyam, take what is necessary for ourself. Don't take more than your quota, knowing well to whom it belongs. Okay? An example, the cow. The cow gives milk. She does not drink that milk. She eats grass and hay. Her milk is designated as food for human beings. This is the arrangement of Krishna. We should be satisfied with what's given to us by the grace of the Lord. Don't take more. Similarly, with our home, property, our buildings, it's made of earth, wood, stone, iron, cement, so many material things. Who gave us them? Where did we get them from? The laborer cannot claim to be a proprietor just because he worked hard to, manu to build it. It doesn't belong to him. Where do we get the resources? So we have to recognize the aim of human life. This is important. Devotees should not be influenced by unnecessary attachment or aversion don't quarrel over material possessions. Be satisfied with whatever privileges are given by the mercy of the Lord. So this is the principle of Atyahara. Right? I wanted to show that to you. Let's see. Okay, go back here. Show. Play from start. No, no, the next play from start. No. Oh, should. Oh, I already could have played from the current slide. Oh. Okay, so we're talking about these uh, things which are favorable and unfavorable. Bhaktivinoda Thakur had given us some advice. Attitudes, the first three, the proper attitude, remember, enthusiasm, patience and confidence. So, Srila Prabhupada explains how the living entity is the Tatasta Sakti, right? You can see on the right here, do we have the Antaranga Shakti, meaning the spiritual energy, on the right side. Oh. So, 
We are the living entity, we are the Tatasta Shakti. Tatasta, Prabhupada explains in one lecture here, which we have shown here. We are spirit soul, we are put into marginal, Tatasta, meaning the marginal energy between the material and between the spiritual. Prabhupada gives an example, just like the margin is explained. We have translated into marginal, just like we go on the Pacific beach. Because Prabhupada was in Los Angeles, Los Angeles temple wasn't far away from Venice beach, and they walk along the Pacific, they see the Pacific Ocean at Venice beach. So Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like we go to the Pacific beach, someday we find the water is covering the beach and someday we see it is open, there is no water. So that is called marginal, marginal, sometimes covered by water, sometimes no water. Similarly, we being marginal potency, we are sometimes influenced by this material nature, not always. Because at the present moment, for sometimes, we are under the material nature. Now, if we try, then we can get out of this covering of material nature and come to the spiritual nature. Right? Under the material nature we suffer. In the spiritual nature there's happiness, there's real pleasure, real enjoyment. Ananda Mayo Bayasat, the nature of the spiritual world is joyful. So, coming back to our picture, on the right side we have the Antaranga Shakti, and on the left side Bahir Anga Shakti. We are Tatasta, we are in the middle. We have that free will, which way do we want to go? We if we do not control the urges, remember the six uncontrolled urges, the urge to speak, the mind's demands, the action of anger, the urge of the tongue, and the belly, the genital, then puts us in the material world, under the Bahir Anga Shakti. And the, with uncontrolled urges, then we develop the unfavorable activities. Unfavorable activities, atyahara, overeating and overcollecting. Atyahara prayashas, over endeavouring. Atyahara prayashas cha prajaupo, prajaupa, idle talk, niyamagraha. Right? Actions which are uh, against the regulative principles or follow the regulative principles only for material benefit and not for spiritual advancement. It's all unfavorable activities, right? So this is the result. You go under this, this is mentioned here, Raja and Tama. The association with the modes of passion and ignorance. We come under the modes of passion and ignorance. We're not in the mode of goodness because we've cultivated these unfavorable attitudes and activities. We want to be very conscious of what's happening. We are responsible. So, we're described there, can you see on the bottom left in the corner there, it's written Dur Atma. Who is, what kind of person is it who has cultivated these unfavorable attitudes and activities? He's described as being a Dur Atma. Dur Atma is opposite of Mahatma. The Dur Atma is the cro crooked soul. His only interest is sense gratification to satisfy his senses. Dur Atma. Prabhupada explains, such mentally crippled Duratmas 
are put under the control of the Lord's external potency, Maha Maya, whose business is to subject them to the influence of threefold miseries. So that you come under the material energy, we're under the Maha Maya, and the business of Maha Maya is to give us miseries. What kind of miseries? Adhyatmika kleshas, right? Miseries due to our body and mind. People suffer a lot, the body and the mind, the mental anxiety, more than ever before, this misery of the mind. Even young children going to school. I, I was in Singapore, I remember, one family, their daughter came home from school. At that time she was only about seven or eight years old and she came home with a booklet, Helping Your Child Cope with Stress. An eight-year-old child had so much stress. Could you imagine? It's, it's not natural that little children at the age of eight should be subject to so much misery. This is adiatmic equation. And people suffer so much. The mind, the mis and what, then the body, so many different diseases are there. Other types of miseries, adibotic kleshas, right? Nice, friendly looking people in the picture. Miseries due to other living entities. Not only humans, but there are many other creatures can give us a lot of trouble. Little insects can give us trouble. Mosquitoes can give us trouble. You know, you can get dengue, you can get malaria. You can get so many viruses, little tiny viruses like this COVID-19 is giving the whole planet miseries. It's another living entity giving us misery. And one more type of misery, adi diving, natural calamities. Earthquakes, famine, drought, heat wave, tsunami, all of these things, right? So, Duratmas explained. But, what can make the difference? Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Bij. If you meet a devotee and you get the seed of the, this Bhakti Lata Bij, the seed of devotion, if we are fortunate, and we contact a devotee, we get the association of a devotee, we start to practice Krishna consciousness, right? You can see in the picture here, and in the association of devotees, the urges are controlled. And instead of being under the Bahiranga Shakti, we come under the Antaranga Shakti and we cultivate the favourable attitudes. We avoid the unfavourable attitudes. Unfavourable activities and attitudes are avoided. We cultivate the favourable attitudes. Mm. And we become the result of this. Sattva. We, we associate with the mode of goodness, sattva sangha. And the result of that association in the mode of goodness means you become mahatmas. Mahatmas become devotees. Devotees are all mahatmas, they're all great souls. They're under the protection of the divine energy. As Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahatmas are not under the material energy, they are under the protection of the divine energy. Here's the verse from the Bhagavad Gita, Mahatmanas tu mamparta daivim prakriti mashrita 
ಭಜಂತ್ಯನನ್ಯ ಮನಸೋ ಗ್ಯಾತ್ವಬುತ್ತಿಂ ಅವ್ಯಾಯ the great souls they are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the supreme personality of godhead original and inexhaustible so they are under the protection of the divine energy divin prakritim they're not suffering they're not under they don't get the miseries which are there in the material world they are under the protection of the divine energy this is a different we're uh, highlighting you can see we've added this verse from the bhagavad gita another verse from bhagavad gita what is night for all beings is a time of awakening for the self control and on the bottom and the and the time of awakening for all beings is night for the introspective sage so you can see the difference between the devotee and the non devotee devotees are here the mahatmas and the non devotees are on the left they're the duratmas the rupa goswami is helping all of us to avoid these unfavorable activities and to cultivate the proper attitude so that we can become krishna conscious from shrila prabhupada's preface again coming back to the preface one must promote himself to the platform of goodness sattva gun by following the instruction of rupa goswami then everything concerning how to make future progress will be revealed so again highlighting the need to come to the mode of goodness to cultivate this mode of goodness to avoid the passion and ignorance so avoiding atyahara this atyahara i showed this the need for simple living and high thinking but this atyahara can come up everywhere prabhupada explains here from nectar of instruction from the purport text number 2 religion entails understanding the laws of god because the proper execution of these laws ultimately leads one out of material entanglement that is the true purpose of religion unfortunately people accept religion for material prosperity because of atyahara or an excessive desire for such prosperity we you know people go to god they go to church they go to temples and mosques they practice religion but the, not everyone's thinking to get love of god they go there for solving their material problems they're looking for some kind of blessing some material prosperity religion is really meant for developing love of god but that mood is not very common today among the people people are just simply thinking about their own desire just like karma kandi path dharma leads to artha material religion will lead to economic development and economic development will bring artha karma sense gratification and so this is the path of material religion but the true purpose of religion is meant for developing love for krishna so we ask you how may devotees be affect affected by atyahara prabhupad says for example the average woman well this was shrila prabhupad's time shrila prabhupad's time we're talking 1960s 19 early 70s prabhupad said the the average lady 
will not be happy unless she has at least 30 saris. So I mentioned the other day, just a few weeks back, I mentioned about 30 saris. Somebody immediately said, not 30, 50. <laughs> so it's changed a bit now, <laughs> you know, figures gone up. I don't know how you feel, but you know, generally, of course, women need more than men. Do we need that many clothes? How often do we wear them? And a jahara is not only in, in relation to clothing. Of course, you have to have some wardrobe, you have to have some variety of clothes. It's not wrong. But a jahara, overeating, we eat things which we shouldn't eat, we eat, we eat things which are not prasada, or sometimes we indulge even in prasadam, overeating prasadam. But over collecting, collecting, uh, we come to Krishna consciousness. You know, maybe when, when you come to Krishna consciousness, maybe you had the experience, we get rid of all the things which we collected before we were devotees. You know, I remember joining Krishna consciousness I had a library, I had a lot of books, I gave them all away, I got rid of everything. I took a lot to the library, gave them, mm, they were happy, but I didn't need them, I was becoming a devotee. So I gave a lot of my stuff away, whatever I collect, useless stuff, you know, but get rid of it, be becoming a devotee. But then when you become devotees, then you start to collect things also. You collect so many bead bags, you have so many dough, you collect different clothes, you collect different books, you have books, you've never read them, you collect magazines. Oh, you know, I used to have so many Back to Godhead magazines, you know, what could I do? You want to save them up, you want to have collector's items, people have the Bhagavatam from Prabhupada's time, collector's item. Oh, that's very nice. That has certainly a lot of value, Prabhupada's original Bhagavatam. But the point is, Ajahara, we have a lot of books, a lot of things. Are we using them? Can we use them? Will we ever use them? What will we do with them? Sometimes we have to analyze these, these situations. Certainly devotees can be affected by Ajahara. Uh, what one devotee was uh, in the class, she said to me, she said, I think I have to join the Krishna Consciousness Movement again. She said, if I could jo if I join again, I'll give away everything I've got now, I'll come back with nothing, it'll be better. <laughs> because you collect so much, you have so much. And things which you're not using, you're not going to use. So you want to keep everything basic and simple. So Rupa Goswami's principle, anasaktasya vishayan yatarham upayanjata nirbandha krishna sambande yukta vairagyam uchate. You can see how Rupa Goswami's principles being applied here in this Krishna conscious situation. When one is not attached to anything, but at the same time accepts anything in relation to Krishna, one is rightly situated above possessiveness. Right? Srila Rupa Goswami has described to us this kind of renunciation. Hmm. Yukta Vairagya, renunciation in relation to Krishna, Krishna Sambandha. That is actual renunciation. Hmm. So that is actually detachment, to utilize everything in relation to Krishna. So this is one way to avoid Atyahara, to just keep what we need for the service of Krishna. We've added another quote here. A Brahmana who is satisfied with whatever is providentially obtained is increasingly enlightened with spiritual power. But the spiritual potency of a dissatisfied Brahmana decreases as fire diminishes in potency 
when water is sprinkled upon it. So one of the important qualities of the mode of goodness, we want to be satisfied with what is provided by the grace of Krishna. So being satisfied with what is given naturally, honestly. Of course, this is the brahmana. And devotee, we want to cultivate that brahmanical nature, the brahmanical qualities. That's from Srimad Bhagavatam, that quote, by the way, 6th canto, 19th chapter. So then we spoke about Prajalpa. Prajalpa, we may be talking things which are not pleasant, you know. The problem with Prajalpa, idle talk, it leads to talking about people. And when we start talking about people, then we often start criticizing them. So this leads to blasphemy. This is the first offense. Is somebody, what's happening here? What do they want? It will bother my eyes, or it should be called enemy also immediately go away. What? They're coming in now? They, but they get disconnected somehow because of internet issues. It's not new people, it's the same people. They oh, are okay. disconnected and then disconnected. Okay. It should go away, or it should be admit, they will immediately go away. <laughs> I'm clicking in, it's not going away. So, Dhamma Prabhu, can you, uh, Maharaj is co-host, so he is receiving these uh, permissions to admit students. Could you make, uh, could you uh, not make the co-host for this, this ID, so that we don't receive these uh, notifications? So I'm, I'm mentioning that when we're, when we speak more and talk more, idle talk, it often leads to blasphemy of a devotee and that's a very dangerous thing, very serious. And so we've described here four kinds of blasphemy. This is one very important reason why we want to be very careful to avoid idle talk. And Srila Prabhupada would often really chastise his servants if he caught them talking or if he hear them, overhearing them talking. He would really chastise them and warn them that this is very bad, you're talking so much, you don't need to be talking all this about people. So four kinds of blasphemy. Someone may be criticized because of their birth, low birth or low caste. We may criticize someone due to sinful activities before they surrender to Krishna, or it may be due to some unpremeditated accidental fall down. And somebody may, you know, un unpremeditated, they didn't think about it, they, it just suddenly it just happened, it was an accidental fall down. It was a one-time thing. So we, we shouldn't criticize them. And some, another final one, to blaspheme a devotee because of the last traces of their previous sins that, that are false, that are almost rectified. So that, you know, we, we've come to Krishna consciousness and some traces of sins and faults, habits, bad habits are there, but we're working on them and they're almost rectified, they're almost gone, so we shouldn't criticize the devotee because of them. If we do, that's blasphemy. So these are four different 
kinds of blasphemy which we should be very careful to avoid. Vaishnav Aparad, very dangerous, very bad for our Krishna consciousness. So that's why it's so important, be very careful what we speak. Don't get into talking about people, criticizing them. Uh, going on, Niyamagraha, Prabhupada's mood in adjusting the details and at the same time maintaining the principles. So this is a very delicate subject matter to keep the niyam, the niyam, to keep up the rules and regulations, at the same time not to be too much attached to, to them and not to be too much neglectful of them, having the right balance. So Prabhupada, as a great Acharya and as our founder Acharya of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, he shows us some very nice examples of how he adjusted some details, but at the same time he was very careful to maintain the principles, right? So, this is the meaning, this, this point is made, practicing rules and regulations only for the sake of following them, not for spiritual advancement. Why would we do that? As we said, people want to get material benefit. They often practice religion for economic development, for their own sense gratification. So one may follow rules and regulations simply for that. So you won't make that, you're not, they're not thinking about spiritual advancement. So that's not good. And similarly, if we don't follow the rules and regulations and we just act independently and whimsically, it's also not good. Oh, this, you're not going to be able to read this, but I'll tell you the story. This is a pastime from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and it describes how a very expert and mature devotee, who was the servant of Lord Chaitanya, we spoke about him yesterday, I mentioned his name as Govinda, and remember that this book was from the diary of Govinda, that he had heard Lord Chaitanya's instructions, and based on these instructions, Rupa Goswami compiled this book. We mentioned that yesterday. So Govinda was the servant of Lord Chaitanya. And so he had, one of his services was to give Lord Chaitanya a massage. So after Lord Chaitanya had taken prasadam one day, he went to take rest. But when he took his rest, he lay down in the doorway of his room. Now, if you go to the, the room where Lord Chaitanya stayed in Jagannath Puri, it's called the Gambira. It's a very small room, very small room, and the doorway is small. So he lay down in the doorway, and Govinda wanted to come to give massage to Lord Chaitanya. So he asked Lord Chaitanya, could you move a little so I can get in and give you, start to give you massage? Lord Chaitanya said, Oh, I'm too tired, I cannot move. I don't have the strength to move my body. So, Lord Govinda said, but I want to massage your legs. So Lord Chaitanya said, oh, it's up to you. You do it or you don't do it, it doesn't matter. It's up to you, do what you like. So then Govinda, he, he put the Lord's uh, cloth over his body and then he stepped over Lord Chaitanya's body and he came into the room and then he gave him his massage. Now this appears to be an offence because one should not step over the body of someone and particularly someone like Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you don't want to be stepping over him. But Govinda did it, he put the cloth over him first and then stepped over him and gave him massage. And after he finished the massage, then he sat there. So it was some time later, Lord Chaitanya had finished taking rest, and 
he had this massage, and you know, after a massage, you can take rest, you feel good, you feel tired, you sleep easily. So Lord Chaitanya took a good rest, and then after some time, he recovered, woke up, and he saw Govinda was still sitting there. So he said to Govinda, he said, why are you still here? You're supposed to go and take your prasadam. After he would give Lord Chaitanya massage, then he would go and take prasadam. But Govinda was still sitting there. So Govinda said, well, I, I didn't like to step over you. But Lord Chaitanya said, well, you stepped over me to come in, to give me the massage. Why didn't you step over me when you went out? So Govinda said, I stepped over you to come and give you service. I came in for your service, but I, I don't want to step over you just to go and eat prasadam. That would only be for my service. I don't want to do that. So Prabhupada explains that this is the principle of breaking a lesser rule for a higher rule. The lesser rule which he broke was stepping over the body of Lord Chaitanya. And the higher rule was to give service, to give the massage to Lord Chaitanya. So this is described in the Ancha Lila, chapter 10, text number 18, 80 up to 102. So you can read it for yourself. You might like to want, you might like to read it. Yeah, text 80 to 102 in Ancha Lila, chapter 10. It's a very important point, nice example. From the character of Govinda, it is to be learned that we may sometimes commit offenses for the service of the Lord, but not for sense gratification. So this is the expertise of the pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada, that we have to adjust. What rules can we break? What rules do we need to follow? Generally, we want to follow all the rules, but for the higher purpose, sometimes we may break the rule. This is described also in Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter 9. Text number 9, Purport. Prabhupada had written there, All the great Acharyas or religious preachers or reformers of the world executed their mission by adjustment of religious principles in terms of time and place. There are different climates and situations in different parts of the world. And if one has to discharge his duties to preach the message of the Lord, he must be expert in adjusting things in terms of the time and place. Right? We have to understand that. Just like when Prabhupada was telling one time, there was one Prabhupada was sending uh, one of his very senior devotees who had been serving him and Prabhupada told him to go to, he wanted him to go to Eastern Europe. At, at that time, Eastern Europe was locked up, you know, it was communist. And so preaching was not legal, but Prabhupada was telling him that you go there and preach. But he said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, if I go there, he said, there, there's, there's, in the winter time, there's only there's no meat. There's only there's only meat. There's no vegetables. He said, "I'll have to eat meat." Then Prabhupada said to him, "Then eat meat, but go there." <laughs> so Prabhupada considered preaching to be more important. Of course, he didn't have to eat meat when he went there. It was it, this was just his excuse. But Prabhupada was making the point again that the, the important principle was preaching and the other, the rules and regulations are secondary to preaching. What time is it? Seven. Seven, okay, still one, half an hour. Okay, 
So we have to be expert. We have one. It, it's not such an easy thing to to adjust things in terms of the time and place. So one wants to be very careful and take guidance from senior devotees. Here's another example. Oh, sorry. Another example of adjusting principles. Describing about brahmachari. Brahmachari strictly prohibited to see even one young woman. Right, brahmacharis. We shouldn't see women. But what can be done? In the western countries, the boys and girls, they mix very freely. And, the, this is quoting Srila Prabhupada, and if I say, my dear boys, you cannot see even a young girl, then finished. My business there is finished. In other words, Prabhupada is saying, if I have to tell all the young men that they cannot even see a, a young girl, they'll never become devotees. They'll never join Krishna consciousness. If they think like that, that, oh, Krishna conscious devotee, brahmachari, you cannot even see, you cannot even look at the girl. Nobody will join. Nobody could follow. Oh, too, very, <laughs> very difficult. Because we're not brought up in that kind of culture. So Prabhupada understood that, particularly in the Western countries, that the men and the women mix together very freely. Therefore, Prabhupada allowed women could also join the Krishna consciousness movement. It was an, an adjustment. And some of Prabhupada's godbrothers, they criticized. They thought, this is, this is not good. How you can let all these young women join the Krishna consciousness movement? But Prabhupada understood the nature of the society. And Prabhupada also saw that the young women were also serious devotees. And the young ladies have done wonderful preaching for the Krishna consciousness movement. In fact, we could say that our Krishna consciousness movement would not be what it is today without the women. It's because Prabhupada made these adjustments that he allowed young women also to take up Krishna consciousness. But, of course, there are dangers because to practice brahmacharya life is very difficult in the presence of so many young women. But Prabhupada says, therefore, I have to arrange according to the country, according to the circumstances, as far as possible. So gradually they are coming to the perfectional state. So, Western countries, like that, India, come, you come to India, it's more natural, young men, young women, they, you know, they don't mix the same, although things are changing everywhere. But generally in Asia as a whole, the young women are a bit more uh, chaste, and the young men are it's easier for them to take up that kind of life. They understand that mood of brahmacharya and the importance of that brahmacharya. So we have to adopt desha kala patra. Desha plays kala time patra, circumstances. But we are keeping our principles as it is, but making arrangement according to the circumstances that is required. So this was Prabhupada in a, a lecture on Srimad Bhagavatam given in India. Prabhupada was explaining possibly to the Indian audience how he had allowed the young ladies also to become devotees and to take up Krishna consciousness. But usually in India, you see it's all men, right? India, different. India is very different everywhere. 
you can see men, you don't see women so much in India. The women are a bit away, but the men do everything, everywhere men. But you go other places, it's all women everywhere. The women doing so many things, driving buses, the women everywhere managing, teaching, everything. And so things differ, different places. More examples about adjustments. Prabhupada said, a preacher must strictly follow rules and regulations laid down in the Shastra, yet at the same time devise a means by which the preaching work to reclaim the fallen may go on with full force. It's a quote from the Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila. Chapter 7, text 38, 9, purport. We have to think how to save the fallen souls. At the same time, we have to follow scripture. So, what was Prabhupada's mood in adjusting details, maintaining principles in relation to Niyam Agraha? Prabhupada certainly had a very special mood in adjusting these details. But he did not compromise on the principles. He kept the principles very carefully. To give some examples. First of all, Prabhupada crossed the ocean. Now we could say sannyasis not supposed to cross the ocean. That's something in the scriptures that sannyasis are not supposed to cross the ocean, not supposed to cross the water, not supposed to go outside of India. Sannyasis are forbidden. Prabhupada did it. Right? Was it proper? Did he break the principles? But taking a boat across the ocean to come to America, was it a great offence? Another adjustment, he allowed the women to live as brahmacharinis in the temples. Unheard of in Vedic culture. Just as we have the brahmachari ashram, there's also a brahmacharini ashram. The unmarried ladies or the single ladies. Of course, the idea of the Brahmacharini ashram is to prepare the ladies for marriage. That later on they will become married. Not that they would stay forever in the Brahmacharini ashram, but later on they would be married and make good wives. So the Brahmacharini ashram was preparing them for their married life. And Prabhupada was also conduct the Vivaha Yagya, the marriage ceremony. He would marry sometimes the disciples. And some marriages were arranged by Prabhupada in the beginning. But Prabhupada became disappointed with that later on. That some the Western people were very restless, not able to stay married and they would change from one wife to another wife. So Prabhupada became disappointed with these marriages and he told them that you do your own marriages future. Of course in the beginning Prabhupada performed the yagya because nobody else was there to do it. So there was a need for the people to be married. Somebody has to do it. Prabhupada did it. He was a sannyasi. Usually sannyasis don't take part in a marriage ceremony. Sannyasi is a walking dead man. He has no material duties. So marriage ceremonies were required. Therefore Prabhupada did it because nobody else was there to do it. It's later on he let his disciples do these things. But in the beginning he had to do it. Another adjustment, Prabhupada would accept Guru Puja in front of the deities. Devotees. See, uh, 
even the spiritual master generally is not worshipped in front of the deities. But Srila Prabhupada did not disturb the mood of the devotees. He saw the devotees' enthusiasm and he would accept the Guru Puja even though the deities were there. Srila Prabhupada allowed devotees to do book distribution in karmi clothes. That he knew the devotees were going out on book distribution and the devotees explained to Srila Prabhupada that some places it's very difficult for us to approach people if we go in our devotee dress. So Prabhupada understood that if they could wear civilian clothes, it would help the book distribution and it would give people a different impression of devotees. So Prabhupada allowed that the devotees could wear dress, but at the same time he encouraged the devotees to dress properly and to dress, to dress smartly. He didn't want them to be untidy or dirty or slovenly, he wanted them to be neat and clean and to be presentable so that people meeting devotees would have a good image of the devotee. And Srila Prabhupada later on supported this principle with a pastime in the Chaitanya Charitamrita where Maharaj Pratiparudra changed his dress so that he could meet Lord Chaitanya. Maharaj Pratiparudra as a king was we wearing his royal dress but he put on a very simple Vaishnava dress and in this way he came and he was able to give Chaitanya Mahaprabhu massage and he was able to get association with Lord Chaitanya. So Prabhupada mentions there about changing the dress, that for the service of Krishna this can be done. So this is an adjustment. Prabhupada also used this name, this title, Prabhupada, and his own god brothers didn't like it very much because he said that's the title of our Guru Maharaj, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada. But Prabhupada thought this is a very nice name and he said in the past, many people like Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, Sanatana Goswami Prabhupada, Jiva Goswami Prabhupada, many of the devotees, great acharyas, they all use this name Prabhupada. And Prabhupada thought, why should we let the Mayavadis use it? We should use it. And so Prabhupada allowed the devotees that we could give him this, use this title in referring to him. It was an adjustment. When they criticized Prabhupada that you're using this name, Prabhupada said, no, I don't use the name. He said, my disciples use it. And then Prabhupada showed his own letterhead, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, and his name card also, Bhaktivedanta Swami. He never put his name as Prabhupada, but as he said, my disciples call me Prabhupada. He said, I don't call myself Prabhupada. So th those were principles which Prabhupada adjusted. Let's look at principles which Prabhupada maintained because we said it's not, you, you can't just adjust every, everything, you have to maintain certain essential principles. One very important principle which Prabhupada maintained was if you get money, print books. Don't use money for sense gratification. And Prabhupada, like the devotees, he said, when you, whatever money you get, 50% can go for temple maintenance and 50% can go for book distribution. And you can, this way you can keep many books in the temple. Keep your money in books. In fact, he preferred the devotees, rather than keeping money in the bank, buy books and keep books in the temple. And then you can use the books to go out for preaching. And whenever Prabhupada would be given donations, people would come, he would say, you can put it in my book fund and then use the money to print more books for Prabhupada. Prabhupada liked to see more books because that was the desire of his spiritual master, 
his spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, had told him, if you ever get money, print books. So Prabhupada remembered this instruction from his guru and he did that. He, whenever he got money, he would use it to print books. He didn't worry much about temples. A little, we built Bombay, Vrindavan, Mayapur. And not much, not much construction, just basic. Another point, Prabhupada did not allow any compromising on the regulative principles. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat-eating and no gambling. Prabhupada was very strict on these things. Anybody who wanted to stay in the temple, they must strictly follow these four principles. Otherwise, they would not, could not be allowed admission into the temple. That's And then only devotees who are serious about spiritual advancement in Krishna consciousness should be allowed to stay in our temples. No lazy people and no mad people or crazy people. No lazies or crazies. So some standards about who is allowed to be devotee. How am I doing on the time? Still have 15 minutes, okay. So Prabhupada was always concerned about devotees. Young people, of course, were joining in Prabhupada's time. It was usually all young people. And when they asked Prabhupada about it, why so many young people are all your disciples? Srila Prabhupada said, because Youth, that is the time for education. He said, so they're coming to me for education. I am giving them spiritual education. The, the Western society, modern world, has not given any spiritual education. They come to me for spiritual education. And when they're young, that's the best time to get spiritual education. So Prabhupada was very concerned. Quality, he wanted quality devotees. He liked to see educated people, uh, people from good backgrounds to come to the Krishna consciousness movement. Not just mad people or lazy people. Uh, these kind of people, we, would, we could give them prasada, but to, you know, difficult for them to advance in Krishna consciousness. So try to keep the atmosphere in the temple up to a good standard. And then also one should accept spiritual master. Right? People coming to Krishna consciousness, it's an important principle. Prabhupada was ready to give initiation, but he did not compromise. If somebody was only chanting 12 rounds, he would say, then first you chant 16 rounds and then you can be initiated. Somebody is only following two principles or three principles, first follow four principles, then you can be initiated. So accepting the spiritual master, one way you could take shelter of the spiritual master, but to actually take initiation, you have to follow strictly. Another quote from Srimad Bhagavatam, 4th Canto. If someone does go and preach, taking all risks and allowing all considerations for time and place, it might be that there are changes in the manner of worship. But that is not at all faulty, according to Shastra. Hey, you're going to preach. You have to take you have to take some risks. So sometimes you have to adjust things. Shri, Srimad Vira Raghava Acharya, an Acharya of the disciplic succession of Ramanuj Sampradaya, has remarked in his commentary that Chandalas 
are conditioned souls who are born in lower than sudra families can also be initiated according to circumstances. The formalities may be slightly changed here and there to make them Vaishnavas. So Prabhupada did like that. He went to the Western world. We were all Chandalas. We were born outside the Vedic culture. But Prabhupada gave us the opportunity to be reformed by practice of the regulative principles of Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada is confirming his action here with this uh, statement from the Ramanuj Sampradaya of Vira Raghava Acharya. They did the same thing. Oh, Vira Raghava Acharya, he would be preaching in India, not outside of India, but the same principle, chandalas, conditioned souls, less than sudras, but they can also be initiated. That is an adjustment. So one meaning of Niyamagraha is to follow the rules and regulations fanatically without understanding the purpose of the rules and regulations. So this is the, uh, this is very bad, you see. You don't understand the purpose of the rules and regulations. You just follow it fanatically, but you don't understand what is the actual purpose of the rules and regulations. They're thinking, usually, purpose is material, to get some material benefit. They're not thinking about devotional service. What is the purpose? The actual purpose of the rules and regulations. What is the actual purpose of the rules and regulations? That purpose is to bring them to sadhana bhakti, to take up sadhana bhakti. Sadhana bhakti means practice of bhakti yoga according to the regulative principles according to the rules and regulations, you could say vaidhi bhakti. So this is the beginning of devotional service. And if we want to awaken love for Krishna, we have to begin like that. We have to begin with sadhana bhakti, practice of the different rules and regulations, and then gradually the heart becomes purified and we awaken our natural devotion because that devotion for Krishna is there in the heart. We, we just have to awaken it. So that's the real purpose of the rules and regulations. But uh, conditioned souls are thinking, other people, sometimes they're thinking, just follow the rules and regulations, we'll get some punya, we'll get good results, we'll get some material enjoyment, like that. So that's wrong. And this is uh, in relation to Srila Prabhupada accepting the Guru Puja in the temple room, in front of the deities. So it's recorded. Uh, one devotee had actually asked Prabhupada about it and Srila Prabhupada explained to him his thinking. Srila Prabhupada said, our goal is to develop love for Krishna and that is more and more important than the little rules and regulations. So Prabhupada didn't consider this to be a very important rule or regulation. Giriraj Maharaj described in one class about this. Giriraj is a senior devotee, a very senior disciple of Srila Prabhupada. He, he said, in other words, Srila Prabhupada thought that if Guru Puja could help us to develop love for Krishna, 
more than following the rule to not worship someone in the temple, it means that some principles are more important and some rules are less important. The Acharya or the advanced devotee can guide us to understand the proper perspective. In other words, the Acharya, he can guide us to understand which rules are important and which rules are less important. So Prabhupada considered this fact, you know, worshipping the spiritual master in front of the deities to be not so important, but he considered the love of the devotees, their enthusiasm, and their desire to offer the worship to the spiritual master was an important thing. So he encouraged them in this way. Okay, maybe before we go on to that, we'll just stop here and ask if there's any questions from anyone, since there's only five minutes remaining. Do we have any questions? Okay. Can we hear their questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, I wanted to understand that what should be our mood towards uh, Maya Devi because uh, sometimes we will be in Krishna conscious, that means uh, in, towards the internal potency, sometimes towards the external potency. When we are in external potency, immediately people say, she is, her, uh, she is our enemy and uh, sometimes people say like, uh, no, we came here to this material world because of our mistake. She is doing our duty. So we should respect her. Like that, two different ways are there towards uh, the concept of Maya Devi. How we have to be there to how to respect Maya Devi. And you say, some people say we should respect her, and other people are saying we should, what? She is like enemy, and uh, she is uh, like that, some people say. Mm -hmm. Well, I do remember hearing from Srila Prabhupada, one occasion at least he had said, the problem with my devotees, my disciples is, they're not afraid enough of Maya. <laughs> So, uh, he, he was a little concerned like that, you know, in our, in our neophyte stage, the, in our neophyte stage, we should be a little afraid of Maya. But certainly, as I mentioned yesterday, the devotee asked Prabhupada, what do you feel when you chant Hare Krishna? He said, I feel no fear. So devotee, as we become mature in Krishna consciousness, then we should not be so much afraid of Maya, but we can develop more the reverential mood, we can offer the respect to Maya. Because Maya is also Krishna's energy. And so she's performing service on behalf of Lord Krishna. So we should respect her also as the devotee of Krishna, the energy of Krishna. We should respect to her. But we also, we're also cautious not to become over-familiar with the material energy and think that we, we're not going to, think that we, we shouldn't think that we can just simply enjoy the material energy. So we want to convert the material energy into spiritual energy by using it in the service of Krishna. So we offer our respects to Maya as, an, as the energy of Krishna. There's Yoga Maya. Yoga Maya and has, has her forms also. There's the Yoga Maya in the, un, under the spiritual energy and there's the Maha Maya for the material energy. And so the Maha Maya 
is also Krishna's energy and she's doing her job bewildering people to keep them in the material world so they don't disturb Lord Krishna and his spiritual pastimes. We offer our respects to Maya and we, we want to uh, go on in Krishna consciousness. Yoga Maya arranges for so many of the wonderful pastimes of the Lord. Yoga Maya is performing so many nice services for Lord Krishna to arrange for his pastimes. We see at the birth of Krishna how Yoga Maya comes as a, the child of Mother Yashoda to be taken. Kamsa wants to kill her. So we offer our respects to Maya. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, and, and one more doubt is how to make sure that uh, on the name of Yukta Vairagya, we are doing our sense gratification or becoming Atyahara. How to make sure that? Yeah, how, how to make sure in the name of, in the name of Yukta Vairagya, huh? that we're not doing Atyahara. Yes, <laughs> Well, we have to be guided by senior Vaishnavas. We have sadhus and Shastra and Guru. We should always be thinking how to minimize. Instead of thinking how to get more, we should be thinking how to use less, how to get use less, how to have less. So, keeping everything nice and simple, that's a nice mode of the devotee. Of course, you have to consider your situation, you know, if you are a family man, then in family life, then you will need a little more. But if you're a renounced person, then it's good to use less. But in family life, if you have a family like that, then you're allowed to have certain needs, basic needs, you know. But again also you try to minimize as much as you can without being, without going to any great excess, extreme endeavors, but try to keep it as basic and as, as possible. Don't over accumulate, try to, try to always minimize as much as you can, as much as is practical. You have to be able to do your service, you have to continue your service, that's important. So you need what's, whatever is necessary for your service to Krishna. We said, Nirbandha Krishna Sambandhe Yukta Vairagya Uchate. So if your items, if you're using certain things in the service of Krishna, then it's all right. But don't, don't, keep, take, don't keep more than what we're needing, than what's needed for Krishna's service. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Krishna. There are more questions, but we have we are a little over time. Oh. So if you want, Maharaj, maybe we can take one question or we can uh, continue. Maybe we can keep the questions for tomorrow. For tomorrow. For, for next week. Yeah. Next class. Um, Maharaj, would you like to announce the open book assignment questions? One and oh, yeah. Now, because there's no class on Monday, because Govardhan Puja, and of course the weekend's coming, so I already looked over the essay questions, so I picked out two, and you know, you can begin thinking about them, you may like to even begin writing. I chose the first question, right, which is about controlling the six urges, that's the one essay you have to write, and the other one is the last question, number eight, isn't it? which is about how ISKCON members are authorized as Raganugas. Rupa, Rupa Nugas, not Raganugas, Rupa Nugas is right, Rupa Nugas. Uh, how ISKCON members are Rupa Nugas? So the first question and the last question, there are eight essay questions. I would like you to write essays on the first one and the last one. 
So I think the first essay you could begin writing. You have, we've covered the first, uh, that first text. You may like to begin writing on it over the weekend. Since you have three days, we're not meeting on Monday. We'll meet on Tuesday and then no class on Wednesday. And those questions which are there can be put, if you could put them in the chat, then it would help us and then we could be, we could be happy to answer them in the next class on Tuesday. Maybe you can post on WhatsApp and then we take a note. Yeah. And then on the next session. Yeah, because I don't want to go over time too much. It's not fair. It's already been two hours. I want to stick to the schedule. So the, those of you who have questions, you're very happy, please put them in chat and then we'll be sure to answer them in the next class. If you could put them in chat on, or in WhatsApp. The WhatsApp. Okay. Or if you like, you just keep them in your mind. But we prefer to have them solid. If you can put them in text, that would be best. Please give us a text. Okay, so we're going to finish up here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Gorbak